Good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning. We're so glad that you came out and joined us. A little bit chilly this morning, so we're even more glad that you came out and joined us. Uh, so as we prepare to worship, let us rise and sing our praises to God. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's confess our sins in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. 
most merciful and gracious God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. Well, morning. Yeah, there you go. Welcome to the home of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Hey. They are now the champions of the Southeast Conference. There is hope. Welcome to everybody, especially to those who are visiting with us, and especially those who are watching at home. We welcome you for joining us in this worship service. We do celebrate Holy Communion. As you all know, the Holy Communion table is open to everybody, all baptized Christians. I see no prayer quilts this morning, so we don't have those. Our nursery is open as a cry room, and uh, I welcome children here, too. I tell people the happiest joy I can hear is some child making noise in the congregation. It indicates the congregation is growing and welcoming to all. That's all the thing I have at this point. Ready for a song.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, at the baptism of Jesus, you proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized into Christ faithful to your calling to be your daughters and sons, and empower us with all, <clears throat> empower us all with your Spirit, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Ready? All right. First reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 through 9. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick. He will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel today comes from Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. You may be seated. It's children's time. Ah, <laughs> uh, here comes my lone child. Hi. How are you? Good. You want to have a seat? You can, right here. You thought I was going to make you sit on the floor, didn't you? But see, the reason I have you sit in the chair and me standing up is because I want you to know how important you are to all the people here. I want you to know how important you are to God. And that's who we greet here when we get here every Sunday morning. I want you to know how important you are to Jesus. And you are. You know what this is? You can stand up and look at it. Have you ever seen this? Oh, they put it in there. Have you ever seen this? Up close? You know what it is? It's a baptismal font, like a fountain. We put water in here, and children, and sometimes adults, come up here, and we take water, and we put it on their head. We do it in the name of the Father, 
name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that's an amazing thing that happens then. Because you know what happens when we do that? They get named. They get called children of God. And the interesting thing is, you never lose that title. You are always a child of God because of what happens here. Do you remember your baptism? I'm not sure. No? Yes? Yes? Good, because I don't remember mine. Because that was so many years ago, no way I could possibly remember that. But the important thing is, even though I was the number of years we won't state, uh, I am still a child of God. I'm still important to God. I'm still important to Jesus. And you are too. Because I'm sure you've been baptized, right? They probably did it when you were a baby, right? They always do that. They bring up the babies and they dunk them and get cold water on them and they cry and scream. That's the way it works. But in the end, you are a child of God for the rest of your life. And the interesting thing is, God will never take that away from you. He will never say, you're not my child anymore. He always says, you are my child. Regardless, you're still my child. Well, of course, you also have those parents and grandparents. Don't ignore them. But what I'm saying is, for those above this, above us, we're children of God. The other thing I want you to remember is, we do something different here. Some churches, they only baptize you if you're an adult or older. We baptize when you're babies. You know why? Because we believe that at that point when babies, there's nothing we can do for God. We're too small. What do babies do? Cry, eat, and mess their diapers, right? That's pretty much it. And sleep. That's about the four basics, right? But at that point when we can do nothing, God calls us and makes us his. We don't have to do anything, and God will do that. And that's a sign to everybody at a baptism, not the child. It's a sign of how much God loves us over and above what we may be like when we're people. What do you think? That's cool. I do too. I do too. Because I'm sure there's somebody, everybody here, one day, you know, somewhere along the way we trip a little bit. Some of us trip a lot, some of us trip a little bit. But the fact is, regardless of when that happens, you need to know that God still loves you. Okay? Let's pray. Lord gracious God, we just rejoice and give thanks that we remember this day our baptism and that we remember that you love us and will always love us and will always be with us and never forsake us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay? I'm Bob, by the way. Who are you? Patrick. Good to meet you, Patrick. Revival and it 
Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I had the privilege not too long ago of watching a DVD that had a pastor from Atlanta by the name of Andy Stanley, who was giving a series, and he told a story that really caught my attention. It turned out that he and his son were on a trip to China, kind of doing some intelligence work on Christianity. But while he was there, he got invited to tour a local factory so that he could see how hard the Chinese people work. But before the tour started, the manager who was going to show them around said, do you mind if I have a, this young Chinese girl join us because she's an intern and she needs to learn things and see how the factory is laid out? And he said, sure, that's not a problem. So they made the whole tour. The girl never said a word and they got back to the manager's office and were sitting there and the manager said to Andy, do you have any questions? And he couldn't think of any offhand, but the Chinese girl raised her hand. And she asked two questions. The first question was, are you a pastor? She had evidently read one of his books. And the second question was the dumbfounding one. Why is it that not everybody in America attends church? And she said that and asked that because she was Christian. But for her to get to church, it was a four-hour bus ride. So she couldn't go there maybe once every now and then. And the best she could do was two hours away from her where she lived was a Bible study. And she went to that. He eventually did a study, a survey of his own congregation and where everybody was at with that. And what came to mind is him after the survey was done is, what made the early church so irresistible? What made the early church so open and welcoming and what was going on there that millions of pagans, atheists, and other assorted people joined it? What was so irresistible about the early church that it grew and it grew and it grew in the middle of a Roman Empire that wasn't tolerating it? No churches, no cathedrals, no clergy dressed in albums and stoles. In fact, at that time, probably the only time it was really going with the apostles, and finally it was John, the last one, who was alive. And the rest of it was just the word. The word and, of course, what they did. Now, we could talk about that and say, well, that's because we're in the United States and we're protected by First Amendment, which is freedom of religion. We have a choice. Not only freedom of religion, but freedom from religion in the sense that our government cannot impose any particular religion, religion on the people of the United States of America. So what happened to that church? Where has it gone to? I think one of my own theories is one that happened was the good old Emperor Constantine. If you don't know the story about him, he was going off to a battle and he had a nighttime dream and vision and there was a cross and he went and won the battle and he said, this is some kind of thing we got here. So he mainly made it the national religion of Rome. And everybody could join. Everybody had to join. It was the national religion. The sad thing, of course, was what happened to the church. Well, we became part of that structure. That's why we wear albs and stoles. Stoles were a sign of your position in the Roman Empire. So next thing you know, we were part. Oh, it was interesting to me because that was all the things that always Jesus was in trouble with. He was always in problems with the local religious and political leaders. And suddenly here was this early church, this movement that he got going, and boom, 
for it. Authority. Well, not today, but probably back then. Along with that, what happened was the sacrament of baptism has taken so many shapes and forms. And in some cases, it's not been a welcoming event. In some places, it's been used to exclude others from the church, from Christianity. Some require a second baptism if you want to join their congregation. I tell you all that because I think it's really, you know, we look at this baptism of Jesus and we say, well, why do we, you know, we all know what that is. Because I think it's important that we take time and we examine baptism for us, for our church, how we use it, how we present it to people. Now, it's curious to me, a lot of people go to Israel and they say, I want to be baptized like Jesus in the Jordan. I think that's wonderful. But the thing that crosses my mind is, do you realize where that baptism got him? It put him on a path of constant conflict with religious and political leaders. It put him on the other side of the railroad track, if you want to put it that way. And finally, it got him four by fours and three nails and a crucifixion. That was the path laid out from his baptism. And not only that, if you go back even further, he was baptized, and then what did they do? Stuck him out in the wilderness all by himself for 40 days. Do you want to be all by yourself for 40 days? Yes? I had a friend once, he said, I'm going to go to a monastery, I want to be by myself, and I want to just, so he shows up with all these books, right? And he shows up with his tape recorder and some music, da, 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 and he gets to the door of the monastery, and guess what they do? They take away his books, they take away his tape recorder, they take away any contact with God, and they stick him in his room. I said, how long did you last? 24 hours, and I had to get out of there. I couldn't stand myself. <laughs> I think of that. But he was out there for 40 days. Not only was he out there all by himself, but he was constantly being pressured to assert his authority over common things that people would accept and go after, besides power and authority. His identity was challenged. So this baptism begins with an argument. That's why, like, Jesus says to John the Baptist, John, baptize me. And John says, what? You've got to be kidding. I'm not supposed to baptize you. You need to baptize me because you are the man. And so I need you to do to me what you want me to do to you. And then Jesus responds, interesting, he says, you know, it's God's work. It needs to be part of God's work. It means becoming part of his work and doing the things we are asked to do. That was his response. And that's what is at the root of Jesus' baptism. He enters the water as one of God's people. And when he arises, the Holy Spirit descends on him. And God proclaims him as his son, which not only gives him identity, but is a calling to his mission. And through his ministry, declare God's love and enlist people to a transformation that begins with love and becomes a declaration of the presence of the kingdom of God. Not in churches, but in believers who gather in these churches and fulfill the commandment of Jesus to love one another as he has loved us. That is the challenge of our baptism. That is what we're called to do. As I told the young man, you're a child of God. What does that mean to us today? And our baptism puts that and lays that out. Our whole sacrament lays that out for us. We have questions that we present to people. Renounce the devil? Force to defy God? Powers of the world that rebel against God? The ways of sin that draw us from God? That's the daily challenge we face. 
a daily challenge put before us. And then we're told, child of God, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever. And then we're given our mission. Our mission is to let our light shine before others, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. That's what baptism was all about. Yes, it makes us a child of God, but for what reason? Because we are the light in the darkness. We are the ones who to carry forth the gospel, the good news, the declaration of God's love. I find the call of baptism reflected in this simple prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle us with the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. And I think that's what we need to keep in mind. Occasionally we do have to ask that Holy Spirit to be active in our lives, to lead us and guide us. One of my complaints is the only time we seem to really get in the Holy Spirit is Pentecost. We put on red, celebrate, sing the songs, and then that's it. We never talk about it anymore. And yet that's exactly where we're pointed in our baptism, to the work of the Holy Spirit. We open the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And lastly, but not least, to be aware that like today, we're going to have that baptism fed with bread and wine, body and blood, and renewed once again in the sense that we are his children of God. We have been called through baptism to be his church in the world. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We now continue with our prayers of intercession. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Calling God, you speak with power to your church. Open our hearts and minds to the new things you are declaring. Strengthen bishops, pastors, deacons, lay leaders, and teachers of the faith. Equip the baptized for your reconciling and redeeming work. Lord, in your mercy. Renewing God, you provide the waters of the earth. And in Jesus' baptism, you reveal the waters of life. Cleanse and protect oceans, rivers, and watersheds. Our own St. John's River. Bring relief to parched lands and to communities without access to safe water. Lord, in your mercy. Righteous God, you're never weary of establishing justice, increased cooperation and constructive dialogue between nations. Guide local, national, and international authorities to govern with equity, vision, and integrity. We pray for those in the military service, for peacemakers, and for our enemies. And Lord, this morning we particularly remember the people of the Ukraine who continue to fight for their freedom and seek peace in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Abiding God, your mercy is steadfast. Give sanctuary to people who flee from oppression, war, poverty, and famine. Sustain health care workers, caregivers, first responders, counselors, and all who help and heal. Comfort those who are grieving or experiencing crisis. And this morning, Zach, and now I just want us to pray for Brooke and Roberta for their overcoming their addiction, for Little Bay, who has healing from cancer, Ian Bailey, who is, he needs healing from cancer, and Vic, who needs healing in his life. Help us, Lord, to remember these and all who are in our hearts and minds this morning. Lord, in your mercy. 
Blessing God in Christ, you gather the beloved community, kindle the gifts of your spirit and your people, accompany the newly baptized, those recently ordained and any beginning a new ministry, inspire synodical leaders and congregational council to serve with imagination and wisdom. And Lord, this morning we especially ask your spirit to be upon the council that we are going to install this morning as they take on their leadership role. Give them strength through the presence of your Holy Spirit. Guide them in all decisions they have to make. Lord, in your mercy. Promising God your faithfulness endure throughout all generations, we give thanks for those who have died in Christ, trusting that we will be united with them and all the saints in Christ's resurrection life. Lord, in your mercy. For we bring to you our needs and hope, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. We now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our worship continues as we collect the tithes and the offerings we've brought for God.
Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to your almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he has shown forth to all nations in the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of the waters turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is not my table. This is not Crossroads table. This isn't even a Lutheran table. This is the Lord's table, and all God's children are welcome. The table is prepared.
start again all i heard is dead and gone now we're your daughters and your sons amazing grace how sweet the sound we once were lost but now we're found wherever you hold us in your arms because that's just the kind of god now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bless you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Anybody have any announcements? Anybody? Anything that's not on here or up there? You all know what's going on in the church? Well, we do have one other thing. It's time for those, and I'll change the language. Not those who have been elected, those who have been called. And if you are going to serve, I want you to keep that in mind. You're here because you have been called by the Holy Spirit to respond to the needs of this congregation for leadership. And the other thing I've always told people who are going to be on council, trust me, when you are in leadership position, there are people who are going to complain. There are people who are going to criticize. And usually there are people who don't show up to do anything, but they'll do it anyway. And what I'm saying to you, always keep in mind, our first reaction is to become defensive when we are criticized. What I would suggest if you're going to be in one of those leadership positions, one of the things I found is if you hear a criticism or a complaint, start asking questions. What is it that you would change? How would you change it? Let the other person speak of what they have on their mind instead of saying, I don't want to hear it. Okay? You'll learn a lot, and maybe you'll even find some things that can be put to work in the congregation. And I hope you keep that in mind, because I can tell you there are a few people that still don't talk to me from when I was a pastor. They didn't like decisions I made. And fortunately, a couple of them just left the church, so that took care of that problem, right? <laughs> if they didn't like it, they could go, you know? So at this time, let's have those people come forward that are going to be installed as council leaders. Baptized into the priesthood of all believers, we are all called to offer ourselves to the Lord. We endeavor to serve his kingdom and bring him glory, not for our salvation, but because of it. It is our privilege to recognize and support those who are engaged in the work of this congregation, especially those in the ministry of the Congregation Council. The following persons staying before me have been elected by the congregation to positions of leadership. So why don't you introduce yourself if they don't know you and what you're going to be doing in the church council? Yes, I'm the online person. Oh, okay. I'm Kelly Lotze, uh, president. I'm Kelsey Pease, fellowship. Mike Dannenberg, treasurer. Joe Pekacek, property. Leanne Clark, Vice President. In holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ liberated you from sin and death and made you members of his body, the church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in faith. By his people, you have been called to positions of leadership. St. Paul writes, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives to everyone ability for particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. 
You are taking this on, and you are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith reflect him in whose name we gather. You are to work together with other members to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation and that God's will is done in this community and in the whole world. You are to be diligent in your specific area of serving that the one Lord who empowers you is glorified. You are to be examples of faith active in love to help maintain the life and harmony of this congregation. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, are you ready to accept and faithfully serve our Lord and this congregation? If so, answer yes by the help of God. Yes, yes by the help of God. People of God, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leaders, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? If so, answer yes by the help of God. People of God, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leaders, and help them as they carry out their tasks? If so, answer yes by the help of God. I now declare you installed as members of the Council of Crossroad Lutheran Church. God bless you with this Holy Spirit that you may prove faithful servants of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. For all who offer themselves in your name, we give thanks, O God. Give them the joy of service and constant care and guidance. Help us all to be both willing servants and thankful recipients of ministry, that your name be glorified, your people bring the light, and your will be done through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Bless you. God bless you. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. To conclude our worship.
in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Good day.